The 19th century was the age of discovery, adventure and travel, with empty spots on the world map being rapidly filled in by bold explorers. It was as if they were participating in a kind of race, an often deadly one. There was one part of the planet that especially fascinated them, the endless white desert of the Arctic. The North Pole became the goal of many groups of pioneers, as by the end of the 19th century it had not yet been officially discovered and explored, remaining a blank spot on the map. Humans had never set foot on the very top of the globe, and the entire Arctic at that time seemed a remote, desert region that only a few dared to travel to. On July 11, 1897, a small team of explorers decided to reach the North Pole in a slightly unusual way. Three Swedish men set out for the northernmost part of the planet in a hydrogen balloon. All three had not been seriously involved in any Arctic travel before. At home, in Sweden, they worked at research institutes and probably didn't realize how daunting their project was, especially for people without appropriate training. The explorers had no idea what there would be at the North Pole. At the time, it was thought to be home to an unknown and mysterious land. In those years, people were organizing all sorts of expeditions trying to reach the North Pole on skis, on dock sleds, even on a huge steamboat which ended up stuck in ice. Today's story is about an attempt to reach the North Pole in the hydrogen balloon. Salomon August Andre, the main figure behind the expedition, was actually an engineer, but he managed to get funding for his project since the hydrogen balloon was one of the most fashionable modes of transport of that time. Salomon calculated that if they could catch the south wind, he and his team would get to the North Pole in just a few days. Andre didn't want to land the balloon on the North Pole itself, and instead, intended to drop a boy there with the message that it was his group that became the first people to visit the North Pole. The following plan was to fly to Alaska, Canada or Russia, depending on where the wind took them. For this triumphant return, the men packed with them American dollars, Russian rubles, as well as luxurious handkerchiefs with their initials, thin gloves and silk scarves. Returning from a dangerous journey as real heroes meant that they had to look accordingly. At 42 years old, Salman August Andre was the oldest member of the expedition. He was born in the small Swedish town of Grena and worked as an engineer at the Royal Patent Office in Stockholm. He had previously been to the Arctic, but only once when he went to Svalbard to participate in a study of how lack of sunlight affects skin color. Interestingly, he quarreled with the rest of the team on that trip Andre was instructed to take paraffin with him, but failed this mission, taking a much smaller amount than was required. In general, Selman was a dreamer, and in addition to flying over the North Pole, he had wanted to cross the Atlantic in a balloon. However, no one wanted to sponsor this fancy of his. Newt Frankel, the second member of the expedition, was 27. He was born in Karlstad and had just graduated from the Royal Institute of Technology. He called himself a civil engineer, though he still had no experience in such work. During the expedition, he was responsible for keeping the weather journal and taking measurements. He replaced meteorologist Nils Ackholm, who was supposed to go instead, but dropped out a year before the expedition due to technical issues. The youngest member of the expedition was Nils Strindberg, the 24-year-old lector at Stockholm University was a very gifted young man with excellent marks in physics, mathematics and astronomy. His job in the expedition was to create a photographic record. Schrinberg had even planned to delve into the languages of indigenous peoples of the north before the flight, but unfortunately didn't find the time. What was the starting point of the expedition? In the Arctic Ocean, near the 80th parallel north, between Norway and the North Pole, lies the Svalbard Archipelago. In its very north lies an island known as Danes Island. In the summer of 1897, the temperature there was minus 3 degrees Celsius, or 26.6 degrees Fahrenheit. At that time, 
everything beyond Danes Island was a blank spot on the map, with the words unexplored area written over it. Salomon, Nils, and Newt built a hangar on Danes Island where they kept their balloon with provisions, warm clothes, and other important items for the trip. Every day, one of them took over the watch. The men were waiting for the south wind, but day after day, the wind didn't come. In the evening of July 11th, 1897, Nils Schoenberg was on duty. In his hands, he held a small calendar, and on the first page was a card from his fiancée, Anna Charlier depicting a balloon rising from the ground. Anna had drawn herself into the picture with a pencil, a small figure with bunched up hair, waving a handkerchief in the direction of the balloon. Nils had already been on the island for seven weeks and missed his fiancée very much. Before his departure, he wrote a will that stated that in the event of his death, Anna was to receive all his meager savings. Anna was 25 years old and worked as a music teacher at a private girls' school. She dreamed of becoming a concert pianist and Nils of becoming a great scientist. Thinking of his beloved, Nils looked out the window and saw that it was snowing. There was no roof on the hangar, so the balloon would inevitably become covered with a wet snow cap. In spite of Salomon Andre's stories about how in summer at the North Pole it almost never snows and is always sunny. The balloon itself was made in Paris from three layers of Chinese silk. The gondola, which was quite small, was to be attached to it just before departure. From it, the members of the expedition would take measurements and photograph the landscape. The team planned to take several boys with messages with them and throw them down from the balloon on their way. The basket also contained 36 carrier pigeons, a gift from the Swedish newspaper Afton Bladet. The expedition was to use half of the pigeons for messages to newspapers, while the other half was intended for the team's personal letters. The men wrote personal messages using shorthand. Nils Schoenberg even taught himself shorthand so as to have the opportunity to write letters to Anna. Under the wing of each pigeon stood the word Andre, so that everyone would know they were bringing letters from the Arctic Daredevils. The balloon was steered with ropes that dragged on the ground, as well as sails. Andre hoped that this way one would be able to control the balloon if the wind changed direction. But this was only an assumption, not a proven fact. The balloon on which the trio was to make their journey had in fact never been in the air before. The team prepared for the expedition as best they could. Their research and calculations took several years. They checked each rope, chose the fabric for the ball, conducted experiments. The materials from which the balloon was made were of excellent quality and were supposed to withstand any pressures. This conclusion, however, was made in the laboratory and the explorers had no idea of how the aircraft would actually fare in the Arctic. As already mentioned, one of the initial members of the team, Nils Ackholm, refused to participate in the expedition because of the technical issues. To be more precise, when Ekholm saw Andre's balloon in real life, he decided that it could never reach the North Pole. In addition, he found out that gas was constantly leaking from the balloon and that Andre was stopping it up in the hangar with hydrogen secretly from the rest of the team. Finding such a project to be too ill-conceived, Ackholm refused to participate and was replaced by Newt Frankel, who, according to some reports, had only agreed to join the expedition for the sake of glory. In the end, however, the team eventually began to track hydrogen leaks and tried to patch the biggest tears with varnish, but it turned out that they had too little of it. In Salomon Andre's early calculations, the balloon could stay in the air for about 900 days, a very bold figure. Later, the number of days dropped to 30, but the journey to the North Pole itself was supposed to take only 6 days, so Andre was certain the balloon would reach its final destination. At the time, however, no balloon had stayed in the air for more than one day. Even 6 days, not to mention a whole month, would have been an incredible technical breakthrough for that time. As is custom, the balloon was given a name, first it was called the North Pole, but later Andre renamed it the Eagle. By that time, many journalists and onlookers had gone to Svalbard. 
the deserted islands had never seen such an influx of tourists. All this time, the gas from the inflated balloon continued to sip through the fabric, and the three adventurers continued to wait for the south wind. On the night of July 11, 1897, after 43 days of waiting, the wind finally came. The decision to take off was made immediately. Hurriedly, the men loaded the remaining equipment and belongings into the gondola. Right before takeoff, they drank some champagne. After all, they were preparing to become pioneers on the North Pole. Here is what Nils Strindberg wrote to Anna about that moment. For a second, my thoughts traveled to you, my loved ones, to home. What will our journey be like? I had to banish these thoughts. A strange feeling, wonderful, indescribable. But we have too much work to do. I took some photos and then we found out we were losing altitude. We threw off the ballast, but we're still falling and then soaring up again. Everything seems to be fine now. We can still hear joyful cries from the island. Yes, the journey of the three brave men wasn't smooth from the very start. When the gondola was untied, the balloon didn't soar upwards as intended. Instead, it got caught in a gust of wind and hit the wall of the hangar. As soon as they were out of the hangar, the balloon caught the wind, but not at all as planned. The wind began to blow into the sails, and the ball started to rotate uncontrollably and rapidly descend into the ocean. Panicked, the team dropped almost all the sand they had, and the balloon finally started gaining height when another problem arose. The three dragging ropes that were supposed to help steer the aircraft got tangled, and two of them detached, making it almost impossible to steer the balloon. Now, the team could only rely on the wind, hoping it would take them in the right direction. Andre's assistants, who were on the shore at that point, would later say that they were expecting an emergency landing, because the mission clearly had to be aborted as soon as possible. But Selman decided otherwise. The ball continued its journey into the distance and soon disappeared altogether. An hour and a half after departure, Nils Strindberg realized that he had forgotten to send his last letter to Anna. He decided there was no other choice and as they were flying over an empty island, he dropped his letter to the ground, where however, no one would ever read it. The wind was changing every few minutes, blowing the balloon in an unknown direction. The snow covering the aircraft made it heavier and was dragging it down. By now, the explorers had dumped all the remaining sand and buoys from the gondola. Soon the team noticed something else. The whole balloon was covered with an ice crust. The eagle was losing height. On July 12th at 3.15 am, it started bouncing across the ice like a rubber ball hovering briefly in the air and then hitting the ground about every two minutes. The jolting was so strong that Nils Strindberg became sick. The explorers thought that the Arctic would always be bathing in sunshine, but on that day, as well as on the ones to come, they were surrounded by a dense fog. Despite Andre's calculation that the balloon could be airborne for up to 30 days, their flight ended just 65 hours after their takeoff from Danes Island as the gondola landed on the ice for the last time. On July 14th, realizing that the balloon would not fly again, Andre released the remaining hydrogen. The team landed around the 82nd parallel, having flown almost 500 kilometers or 310 miles. This was not even a record. In 1895, the Norwegian explorers Nansen and Johansen had crossed the 86th parallel on skis. Salomon Andre's group knew this, and this fact greatly upset them. The men started pulling out everything that was in the gondola. For transportation, they had sleds and a small boat. The sleds were intended for short distances. The adventurers believed that in the worst case, the balloon would land somewhere in Canada and they would have to cover the last part of their journey on their own. The trio stepped onto the ice at 8.11 am and soon lost any idea of where they were. Since it was summer, the sun didn't set and everything was constantly shrouded in a thick white haze. As far as the eye could see, there was only ice merging with the sky at the horizon. Andre, Frankel and Strindberg 
began to look for something that could help them survive. Water, shelter, perhaps an indigenous settlement. But they didn't know that there was nothing but ice where they had landed. While Nils Strindberg was struggling for survival, Anna, his fiancée, was spending her vacation in his family's summer house. It was there that Nils' father, Oscar Strindberg, read the telegram. The balloon has gone to the North Pole. Upon hearing this, Anna began to cry. In that very second, she felt that she had lost Nils. Oscar tried to console her, and they agreed that they would only start worrying if there was no news from Nils in a year. They didn't think of the North Pole as a wild and deserted place, but believed it was inhabited, and thus presumed Anna's fiancé would survive there. On the sixth day of the journey, on July 18th, Strindberg, Frankel, and Andre woke up and saw that all their carrier pigeons had flown away, meaning they would no longer be able to maintain contact with the outside world. How did they survive after landing? At night, they camped in a silk tent and in one deerskin sleeping bag for all three of them. All this time, they were asking the same questions. What should they do now? Which way should they go? They continued pondering these questions for a whole week. Fortunately, they had a lot of food. There were even cookies, sardines, and canned pies. They decided to pack the essentials onto their sleds and set off. The essentials included medicine, guns, and several bottles of whiskey. The travelers knew that they could only count on someone saving them during the summer months, because after that, the ocean freezes up and ships cannot get to the ice-choked islands of the north. The closest point where they hoped for help were the Seven Islands, the northernmost part of Svalbard, 300 kilometers, or almost 190 miles from the place where they had landed. All this time, Nils was writing letters to his beloved Anna, where he talked about the fact that misfortune had befallen them, but tried not to worry her too much. Of course, these letters could not reach Anna. So the three men loaded their sleds and set off. Each sled weighed about 200 kilograms, or over 400 pounds, making them impossible to drag for one person. This is how they progressed. First, they pushed one sled together, then returned, pushed the second sled to the same place and returned for the third. Soon the trio realized that at such a pace, they would never reach their destination. They had to drop some of their load. To add insult to injury, the ice was drifting in the opposite direction of their movement, meaning that their efforts were in vain, as they weren't getting any closer to their destination. The adventurers threw away some heavy things to unburden their sleds. Some of the things they kept as necessary, however, seemed somewhat strange. For instance, Frankel refused to part with several heavy encyclopedias, while the other two took with them silk scarves and tablecloths. It was important to be very careful when walking on ice. Every now and then, it cracked, floated, or suddenly disappeared from under the explorer's feet. Nonetheless, the team began to collect interesting specimens along the way. Twigs, algae, the eyes of seagulls, to investigate why gulls don't suffer from snow blindness. They took photographs and made sketches. Though the travelers were in danger, they didn't give up science, for it was science that gave meaning to their ordeal. On July 24th, Anna Charlier was celebrating her 26th birthday. As a gift, she received one of the carrier pigeons that Solomon Andre's team hadn't taken with them. Nils also wrote her a letter that day, which however never reached her. My beloved, my dear, We've just stopped after dragging sleds for a whole 10 hours. I'm a little tired, but I need to exchange a few words with my beloved. First of all, I want to congratulate you. It's your birthday today. How I wish I could let you know that my health is fine and you don't have to worry about us. We'll be back, you'll see. Meanwhile, the ice was drifting. According to Strindberg's calculations, they should have reached their destination in six to seven weeks. But because of the ice drift, this didn't seem possible anymore. Strindberg began to freeze. Already during the flight, his feet were cold. 
and as time went by, the ice only worsened the situation. He was constantly stepping in puddles, and soon even the straw they had stuffed into his boots was of no use. His feet were permanently wet. He set off for the journey in fashionable clothing that was suited for a swift balloon flight, not for days of trekking on drifting ice. Around his neck, he wore a golden heart-shaped locket in which he kept a photograph of Anna and a strand of her hair. In September, the ice began to freeze up, and in order to move across it, the trio often had to walk knee-deep in icy water. Finally, on September 8th, the group made a difficult decision. They would spend the winter in the ice. Frankel's and Strindberg's feet were in such terrible state that they simply could not go any further, so the team decided to build an ice hut. Their food supply was dwindling rapidly, however, they managed to hunt down a polar bear and a seal. Starving, they even ate most of the insides, including the brain and liver. Soon, more polar bears began to appear near their hut. They smelt the food and didn't want to leave hungry. The ice hut became a helpful hideout for the travelers, and they even started calling it their home. Unfortunately, after some time, the ice floor of the hut cracked and it was flooded with water. And once again, the explorers were left without a home. Once more, they found themselves struggling against the Arctic ice. They began hunting, hoping that in the best case scenario, the meat would last them till spring. One day, Selman noticed a piece of land, a lonely island that was not marked on the maps. Andre thought that it was the so-called New Island that he had heard about from travelers. Stringberg and Frankel named the island Kvitoya, or White Island, and that is the name that it bears to this day. The team continued their journey, but they never appeared in Canada or in Russia or on any of the known islands of the time. It seemed they had disappeared into the thick white fog, treading across endless ice and struggling with the eternal cold of the Arctic. In the summer of 1898, one year after the balloon's departure, Anna began to worry. She, along with Nils' brother and father, explored all sorts of versions of what could have happened to the team, even the most terrible ones. There were rumors of screams heard in a cave on Svalbard that someone had found three bodies in the Siberian hut and that someone else had seen a carrier pigeon of theirs in England. By 1906, Nils was officially considered dead. His relatives had realized that there was no hope of him returning. Year after year, Anna waited for her fiancé until 12 years later she finally married another man, Englishman Gilbert Hawtrey, a French teacher. Together they moved to the United States where Anna became a concert pianist, fulfilling her dream. She often sent letters to Sweden writing to the family of her ex-fiancé Nils, where among other things, she complained about her shaking hands. Anna and Gilbert had no children, and on a shelf in her new home in the US, there stood a stuffed carrier pigeon with Andre's stamp under its wing. A few more years passed. The summer of 1930 was incredibly warm, especially by Arctic standards. 33 years had passed since the disappearance of the Eagle and its three passengers. Kvitoya Island of the Svalbard Archipelago is one of the most inaccessible islands in the north. It is almost constantly surrounded by drifting ice. However, in 1930, the ice finally parted and the expedition of Norwegian geologist Gunnar Horn managed to pass near the south of the island. On board his ship, were not only geologists, but also several seal and walrus hunters. These included Olaf Sullen and Carl Tusevik, who were only 18 and 23 years old. They had never heard of Solomon Andre's expedition, and while the older hunters were carving a freshly caught walrus, the two decided to explore the island. Unexpectedly, right under their feet, they noticed something indicating the presence of people, a tin can lid on the stones. The young hunters decided to continue searching the island. After walking a few more yards, they saw a dark figure next to a glacier. As they came closer, they saw that it was a small boat. Next to it stood a sled with frozen things on it. Sullen and Tuswick called the others. The skipper of the ship, 
who was on duty nearby, came closer and began to clear pieces of ice and snow off the sled. After a few moments, they saw the inscription, Andre's Expedition, 1896. The skipper couldn't believe his eyes. He had heard about the missing travelers, whose tale had by then turned into a legend, but no one expected that they would ever be found. Gunnar Horn forbade everyone to touch anything, because first they had to take pictures of their discovery. Soon he heard a shriek. The skipper had stumbled across human remains. It was the body of Salomon Andre. He was leaning against a rock as if sitting. A little further away, they found a stone grave with Nils Schrinberg's body. Horn decided to free the bodies of the two travelers from the ice, along with their belongings, the boat and the sleds. The expedition took up the job. For some reason, they weren't able to find the body of Knut Frankel, so Horn decided to return in a few weeks and try to resume the search. However, when they returned to the island, it was choked by impenetrable ice, making an approach impossible. At around the same time, the journalist Knut Stubendorf had gone to the Arctic. He wanted to find Gunnar Horn's ship and get an exclusive interview with him about the finds on Kvitoya. Stubendorf rented an old ship with only one engine running and sailed north for nine days. When he finally reached his destination, the ice that surrounded the island had parted. So Stubendorf and his crew moored the ship. The snow had melted, revealing more and more belongings of Andre's expedition. Stubendorf had with him a photographer who took pictures of all their finds. Some things had to be gouged out of the ice. This was how they finally got hold of the body of Knut Frankel. However, one of the excavators accidentally plunged his ice pick right into Frankel's skull, which had been hidden under a layer of ice. Thanks to this expedition, now the bodies of all three travelers could be returned home. Alongside the bodies, the expedition took many things from the island, including photographs, diaries, and letters. Nils' engagement ring was also found, between the stones of the shallow grave in which he lay. His fiancée Anna, now 59 years old and bearing the name Hawtrey, was living in England. When the body of Nils was found, she was visiting his cousins in Sweden. Back home, the bodies of the travelers were received with special honors. After all, they were welcomed as heroes, though a whole 33 years later than they had hoped. Among the thousand threats that covered the coffins, one had a modest ribbon with the words to Nils from Anna written on it. The bodies of the explorers were cremated. At the time, cremation was considered a fairly novel way of laying the deceased to rest, and Andre even belonged to a so-called cremation society, thereby expressing a desire to be cremated after death. Strindberg's and Frankel's stance on cremation was not known, but they were nonetheless cremated together with the leader of the expedition. This complicated any attempts to determine their causes of death, no bones or hair were left that could have perhaps helped solve the mystery of their demise with the use of modern forensic methods. What happened to the three strong, healthy men? Why did they die and how? What was known for sure was that Strindberg died first and was even buried. His teammates paid their dues to their fallen comrade by making him a shallow grave in the stones. But what did he die from? As we mentioned before, next to the bodies were found the diaries of the explorers, which revealed that at the start of the journey, all three explorers were healthy. But after a week in the icy desert, they started getting odd symptoms they had never experienced before. The men kept meticulous records of everything that happened to them, writing down on a daily basis the temperature of the air, describing their mental state, what food they ate, and what medicines they took. On July 12th, 1897, while the balloon was still in the air, Andre wrote, We're in, in an excellent mood. I cannot deny that we're all filled with pride. But as early as the 13th of July, just two days after their departure, Strindberg developed air sickness. By the 14th of July, all three were hungry and tired. On the 19th of July, Andre hunted down their first polar bear, and on the 21st of July, they started eating it. On July 23rd, just three days after they left the balloon, Andre wrote in his diary 
that their sleds were too heavy and non-durable. After a few more days, all three were feeling exhausted. During that time, they subsisted on polar bear meat marinated in salty seawater. Their boots became sopping wet, and Frankel developed the first symptoms of snow blindness, which is caused by UV rays burning the cornea and conjunctiva of the eye. By August, the bear meat that they had been eating began to taste like rubber overshoes, as Andre himself put it. This was when the ice began to drift, carrying the trio out into the ocean. On the 5th of August, they spent the whole day crawling across the ice. That's how challenging the terrain was. On the 8th of August, all three of them got a runny nose, and on the next day, Frankel started suffering from diarrhea again. He was offered opium as a treatment, which was standard practice at the time. It's pretty amazing that they didn't catch a cold or die from hypothermia or pneumonia. On the 13th of August, Andre shot a female polar bear and two cubs. By this point, the travelers had already been eating not only the meat of animals, but also all their internal organs. On August 15th, all three became ill, had digestive problems, and Schinberg also injured his hand. By the end of August, the men had been eating bear meat raw, considering it a delicacy, while Schinberg and Frankel developed severe pain in their legs. All three were suffering from diarrhea after it occurred to one of them to make soup from seaweed. As if all this wasn't enough, the travelers started carrying bear meat on their bodies to prevent it from freezing not realizing this meant bacteria would be growing in it. In early September, the traveler's health got worse. Andre suffered from constipation. Frankel's leg hurt incessantly. Andre tried giving him a massage, but it didn't help. At one point, they shot a seal and consumed its liver and intestines. This could have led to botulism and an overdose of vitamin A, both of which can be deadly. The explorers knew about the dangers of consuming bear liver, but were not aware of the same danger from seal liver. On the 5th of October, Andre Strindberg and Frankel reached Kvitoya. What else do the diaries say? The men were cold, their feet were constantly wet. The bags and the baskets with food took in water, becoming impossibly heavy. All members of the team suffered from incessant colds and digestion problems. Frankel had it worst of all, even though at the beginning of the expedition he was considered its toughest member. Schreinberg was worried about his feet and festering wounds, which he mentioned in his diary several times. The last entry in his diary is from the 8th of October. These records were severely damaged due to water exposure, and thus, unfortunately, nearly impossible to decipher. The only thing we know from them is that something happened to the Primus stove that the travelers used for cooking. It may have been lost or broken. As for how the explorers died, this is still a question open to controversy. Here's what we know about their fate. The bodies of the three travelers from Kvitoya were first brought to Norway, where they were examined. None of the members of the expedition had broken bones, but some body parts were missing, most likely eaten by polar bears. Frankel had not been wearing boots or mittens at the time of his death. In Andre's front pocket were found Schreinberg's documents and the golden locket with Anna's photo in it. There was a coin-sized round hole of unknown origin on Schreinberg's forehead. No samples were collected from the bodies, though at the time that was already standard practice. The deaths of Andre and Frankel raise more questions than that of Nils Schreinberg, who, as we know, died earlier and was buried. Frankel, perhaps, died in his sleep because he wasn't wearing boots, and going onto the ice without them in October would have been a very strange decision. The only place where they took off their shoes was in their sleeping bag. We can also assume that Andre was the last survivor. He died sitting, with a gun and several cartridges next to him. Andre was clearly ready to defend himself, though maybe he simply went outside for the last time, having taken some morphine, knowing what happened to his comrades and realizing that no one would find him on this island that wasn't even on any map. Or perhaps he just froze while leaning against a rock in exhaustion. 
However, the biggest piece of evidence were Strindberg's torn trousers and jacket in which he had been buried. The tears on them were typical for a bear attack, and it could be concluded from circumstantial evidence that Strindberg died whilst on his feet. The diaries of the explorers, by the way, show that they treated polar bears rather lightly, believing that they could be easily scared away. Perhaps it was this factor that played the key role in Strindberg's fate. The diaries mention that he had already once before gone outside the camp to chase away a bear and had not taken a weapon with him. As for Andre and Frankel, all we know is that a vial with morphine tablets was found next to Frankel's body. He died in his bed, possibly consuming it. Perhaps he intentionally took too much, knowing he wouldn't wake up after such an amount. Or maybe he was just trying to ease the pain. What's strange about that theory, however, is that if Frankel had been taking morphine as a painkiller, he would have likely combined it with anti-inflammatory drug. But the bottle with those pills had remained intact. There are many other possible versions of events but none of them has been proven. There have been suggestions of hypothermia, carbon dioxide poisoning, a parasitic infection known as trichinosis, an overdose of vitamin A, lead poisoning from food cans, or botulism from undercooked meat. However, if it were illness or poisoning that the men succumbed to, surely they would have taken medication in an attempt to relieve their symptoms. So the question arises, could it be that Andre and Frankel voluntarily took their own lives upon seeing what had happened to their friend and knowing that a similar fate inevitably awaited them. We'll likely never know the answer, for only ashes remain of the explorer's bodies. Several years ago, a rib was found on Kutoya, which researchers hoped belonged to Frankel. However, it turned out to be a bear's rib. Thus, the details of the expedition's fate remain a mystery. Anna Charlier died at the age of 78 and was buried with her husband, Gilbert Hawtrey. However, Anna had one last wish, which was fulfilled on September 4th, 1949, the day that would have been Nils Strindberg's 77th birthday. Anna made instructions that after her death, her heart be cut out and cremated separately. In the early hours of September 4th, 1949, a small procession consisting of Nils Strindberg's brothers secretly lowered a small silver box into his grave. As you've probably guessed, it contained the ashes of Anna Charlier's heart. Even after so many years, she gave her heart to her first love. Please share in the comments how this story made you feel. Do you think that the mysteries of Solomon Andre's ill-fated expedition will ever be solved? I think the most plausible version is that Nils was killed by a bear whilst his teammates, upon seeing the gruesome attack, lost heart and sought oblivion in opiates, eventually freezing to death. Thanks for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to my channel to not miss any new of my videos that come out every few weeks and write in the comments what other stories you'd like to hear about.